This week on Heartland Highways, we invite you on a tour. First, we'll stop at the Treader Museum at Lincoln Land Community College in Springfield, Illinois. Philip and Mary Catherine Treader love to travel the world. During their travels, they collected many world and cultural items that we'll share with you in this story. Staying in Springfield, the next stop is to Edwards Place, the oldest home in Springfield still on its original foundation. The home also has ties to Abraham Lincoln. Finally, we'll revisit the historic and scenic covered bridges of Park County, Indiana. Uh, because we hold more covered bridges within our county boundaries than anywhere else. Um, we have about 90 approximately covered bridges left in the state of Indiana, but presently we have 31 covered bridges. We originally had 52 and a half covered bridges. Ownership was claimed by Park in Vermilion County for a covered bridge that crossed Vermilion, or crossed the Wabash River. So, we now have 31. They're very, very treasures to us here in Park County because they're a piece of history that we can see and touch, and some of them we even use on a daily basis still. That's coming up next on Heartland Highway, so don't go away. Welcome back to Heartland Highways. I'm Lori Casey. And I'm Kate Pleasant. And this week we're headed to the capital city of Springfield to check out two museums. First, we're off to Lincoln Land Community College for a tour of the Trutter Museum. Now, this is the personal collection of world travelers and Springfield residents Philip and Mary Catherine Trutter. From the 1950s through the mid 1970s, the couple traveled throughout the world and collected a vast array of art, artifacts, and other cultural items of interest. When Mr. Phil Trutter was in his 70s, he began taking art classes at Lincoln Land Community College. And he became very good friends with one of our former art faculty members, Jack Madura. And based on that friendship, he formed a relationship with the institution. And when he died in the year 2000, he left to the college a stipend of $1.5 million, as well as the collection from he and his wife's travels. And it was those travels to 100 countries that resulted in a one-of-a-kind collection of art and cultural items amassed from one end of the globe to the other. Today, the Philip and Mary Catherine Trutter Museum at Lincoln Land Community College continues their appreciation and love of world culture. They enjoyed the adventure. They weren't considered tourists because they wanted to learn the culture. They wanted to go where the locals ate. They wanted to um, not stay in the hotels that maybe was, you know, Americanized. They wanted to stay in the local hotels. They really wanted to include that cultural part of their adventure. After retiring as a successful architect, Philip, along with his wife, Mary Catherine, or Kitty as she was known, began their world travels in earnest. He was interested in the more exotic. And obviously when he went to places like Papua New Guinea, uh, he again in his interviews would tell us, I made connections to stay with one of the local tribal people. I wanted to go into their accommodations and I wanted to eat what they did, even if it was crawling on the plate. So both of them had that adventure spirit. And I think one of, um, uh, she's still alive, one of their travel companions said, oh, they would eat anything and they'd go anywhere. Places that didn't have, you know, restrooms, <laughs> you know, accommodations. And she said, I would always say, okay, I'll meet you in the next country. <laughs> so again, they had that, you know, that real appreciation, I guess, and adventuresome spirit. As they traveled, of course, they ended up uh, not being shy. They would introduce themselves to some of the top officials of the countries. They made dear friends uh, of a General P in China and began kind of a lifelong uh, relationship with, with him. Uh, many times as they traveled, they would contact the embassies where they were. Again, weren't shy. They wanted to kind of make an introduction. As part of their travels, the Trudders began collecting items from their journeys. Mrs. Trutter collected jewelry and she 
beautiful jade, cloisonne, and uh, Mr. Treader was, of course, art and, and items that had some more historical significance. As they traveled, many of the items today probably would not have been its new standards. Countries back in the 60s and 70s didn't have the rules that they do today. So a lot of the items are precious to the to some of the countries and they probably wouldn't have accept, you know, let him leave with them. So uh, we're very conscious of that as all museums are in the country is to be proper about, you know, how their uh, the collection is um, uh, the provenance of that and making sure that it, it isn't done back in the back door. Signature items in the collection include artwork by Marc Chagall and Salvador Dali, ancient pieces like this Chinese wine vessel, as well as ceremonial items from various countries. It's the stories though. We've, we stress that. Um, with any item you can look at it and I try to tell people, you know, close your eyes for a second and open it. What part of the world are you in? You know, what is the food that you're eating? What kind of a home are you in, living in? What are the smells? Is it in the city or is it out in the country? So the, the items in themselves are beautiful and, and probably significant, but it's a cultural thing I want you to remember. I want you to, you know, put yourself into that world and try to, you know, what's the language that they're speaking? There are also personal items, including Mr. Treader's handcrafted puzzles. Again, he was not only an artist and architect, but he was a craftsman. So again, you give him um, kind of a, um, a project. His wife loved puzzles, and he, he said to her, I can make you much better puzzles and much more interesting. And he did. He set aside a jeweler's jig jigsaw and carved some very intricate puzzle pieces. Over, we understand, over 200 pieces. The Treader collection includes more than 750 items, which are not all on display. Rather, the museum took a different approach when setting up the exhibit. First of all, we did not want to install a permanent exhibit. Um, we just, there was too many, too many items in the collection, and we didn't want it just to be cases of curiosities. Um, I think sometimes that's a danger in museum displays. Um, we felt it was more important to tell stories with each item, to really showcase each item. And you can't do that when you're just stacking things in, in, in big cases. So um, we decided we are a two-year college, that that seemed to be the right format. We would have uh, various themes and change our exhibits every two years. His purpose for leaving it to Lincoln Land Community College was that he wanted our students, who may not be able to travel the world or even travel outside of the state of Illinois, to be able to travel the world through his eyes. And hence the reason that we have the collection. I think that we were so pleased that Mr. Trotter saw the value of education and it fits so closely with our mission to serve faculty, students, staff, and the, and the community. And we serve students from youth to those who want to continue learning for a lifetime. And this gallery assists us in providing that for, for those individuals. The museum is open for tours Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from 10 to 3 or by appointment. Some of our favorite adventures were ideas that came from viewers like you. If you think there's a place we should see or a person we should meet, let us know about it. Drop us an email at heartlandhighways at weiu.net or send us a letter to 600 Lincoln Avenue, Charleston, Illinois 61920. Our second stop in Springfield was to historic Edwards Place. This over 4,200 square foot spread was once the home of Benjamin Edwards and his family, some of which had ties to Abraham Lincoln. We'll make that connection for you in this story, so take a look.
Today, this is a historic house that interprets the social and domestic life of 19th century Springfield. Um, we want to give you the story of what life in Lincoln Springfield was like. Um, when you go to a Lincoln era house, you know, why is it furnished this way? How would they have used the space? Just, you know, what was living like before the Civil War? It's set in the neighborhood once deemed the jewel of Springfield, and many say that neighborhood is on the rise again. It is Edwards Place. The historical home is the oldest on its original foundation in the city and the former home of the son of former Illinois Governor Ninian Edwards. It was built in 1833 by a man who um, later after his death it turned out that he had fled his first wife in a pile of debts in New York, came through St. Louis, changed his name, married again, so he was kind of a bigamist, and come to settle in Springfield and reinvent himself. He was the first owner, he was here for 10 years, and then he sold it to the Edwards family. This is Benjamin and Helen Edwards, and Benjamin is a son of the governor of Illinois, Ninian Edwards, and a brother of Ninian Edwards Jr., who's married to Mary Lincoln's sister, so lots of family connections there. So Benjamin and family live here from 1843 until 1909. Helen Edwards, Benjamin's wife, was the last occupant of the house. She died in 1909, just shy of her 90th birthday. After that, the house sat empty for a few years, and then um, the Amateur Art Study Club of Springfield approached her middle daughter, Alice, and asked permission to rent a couple rooms for their art meetings. And Alice came back to them and said, you know, it makes me sad that my parents' house is sitting empty. I'd really like to do something good with it. I'd like to give you the house. And so the house was formally deeded over to the art club in 1913, and it was incorporated that same year. So um, from about 1913 to 1944, the house we're in was actually the art gallery with the arts hanging on the wall. The gallery functioned as such for a short time before the Art Association realized just exactly what they had. no original intent that the house would um, become a monument to her family or her family's history. It was supposed to be used as an art school. And it really wasn't until, as I understand it, after the Second World War, they realized that they were sitting on an historic monument. It's the oldest house on its original foundation. The Edwards family has many connections to the Lincolns, and by that time, Ninian Edwards' house had been torn down, and it was the decision of the Art Association that they build the new studios um, off to this side and stop letting the kids draw on the walls <laughs> and restore Edwards' place to be a house museum. And so that process began. Now, with the centennial anniversary of the Art Association coming up, the next step is to take the house to a whole new level while bringing it back to as close to its original state as possible. Two years ago had a study that was funded by the Jeffress Foundation as an interior finish plan. They created a plan based on drilling through the walls and finding out what was underneath everything. And um, so now we have that plan in hand, and as part of our centennial celebration, we will be raising the money to implement that plan. We started with the dining room, so we're really trying to bring it back to the most accurate mid-19th century appearance that we can. Um, so from the dining room, we'll move on to these parlors, the hallway, hope to do the first floor first, and then on to the second floor. So as people keep coming back, hopefully they'll see something different each time. Currently, the house contains many of the original items owned by the Edwards family, from bookcases to furniture and even family portraits. A few items that attract special attention, however, are those that have a connection to Abraham Lincoln. Benjamin Edwards had a brother, Ninian, who's married to Mary Lincoln's sister, which sounds like six degrees of separation. In Lincoln's time, he considered Benjamin in the family. They you know, knew who all their kin and connections were, and so they were kind of connected by marriage. And so um, Mary and Helen Edwards were actually very good friends. They met when the Edwardses first came to town in 1840 and remained friends the rest of their lives. 
you would have found Lincoln in these very parlors where we're standing, coming to one of the Edwards's legislative parties. Um, the high social season in Springfield is when the legislature was in town. This brings all the politicians to town, and all the prominent families would have taken turns hosting this grand reception in the evening. So the Edwards being major players on the social scenes were having a lot of these parties, and the Lincolns would have come here as guests. We have what we call the courting couch, and this is the sofa that sat in Ninian and Elizabeth's parlor in their early days in Springfield. So when Lincoln, as a young man, was coming over to court Mary Todd, they would have sat right on that sofa in their parlor. We also have the Edwards' piano right here, and this is the piano that played the music when the Lincolns were married in the Edwards' parlor. Eventually, a small gallery and then more additions were made to the historic home that became the all-encompassing campus for the Art Association. Blending the history of Edwards Place with current arts events, classes, and research is a challenge, but something that organizers say is unique and well worth it. Just next to this, we've got the Michael Victor II Art Library. We have between four and 5,000 volumes uh, that are dedicated to the visual arts. So we've got the library, we've got the offices, but on the other side of that, we have three large studios where we offer classes throughout the year. We have four semesters each year of eight-week classes, plus weekend workshops and um, all kinds of seasonal workshops. We have summer art camp. Um, lots of kids come through here in the summer, again, in a variety of media. And then we have a separate building even beyond that that is our ceramics lab. It is sometimes tricky uh, because the history and historic preservation worlds are a little bit different from the art education worlds. Uh, sometimes I feel like this place is a five ring circus, <laughs> which is in a good way. There's just a lot going on in a lot of different capacities. And, um, you know, because the house is one entity, the school is another entity, the gallery has sort of has its own life, the library has its own life. We always have events going and history events are different from art events. And yeah, it's kind of an interesting balance. Yeah, there's always something going on here to, uh, explore the arts and appreciate other people's work and um, plenty of opportunities to learn new techniques and explore your own creativity as well. Finally today, Park County, Indiana is known for one thing, the Covered Bridge Festival well, more like the reason for the festival, the covered bridges themselves. A few years ago, we were able to go to Park County in the fall and take in the beautiful fall backdrop for the historic covered bridges. We're happy to bring that story to you again today. Chances are you've probably heard of bridging the gap, and there's little doubt you're familiar with the phrase water under the bridge. Luckily, that probably means you're familiar with what this story is all about. Covered bridges are a rural American icon, and for this adventure, we went straight to the Covered Bridge capital of the world in Park County, Indiana. Park County is considered the Covered Bridge capital of the world uh, because we hold more covered bridges within our county boundaries than anywhere else. Um, we have about 90 approximately covered bridges left in the state of Indiana, but presently we have 31 covered bridges. We originally had 52 and a half covered bridges. Ownership was claimed by Park and Vermilion County for a covered bridge that crossed Vermilion or crossed the Wabash River. So we now have 31. They're very, very treasures to us here in Park County because they're a piece of history that we can see and touch, and some of them we even use on a daily basis still. Covered bridges were built because our early settlers that came here found that wooden plank covered bridges didn't last very long. Mother Nature wasn't too kind to them. So engineers and constructors of covered bridges at that time and builders found that if they covered them, they lasted much longer. And a prime example is our Crooks Covered Bridge that's located in the southern part of the county. It's built in 1856. We still use it on a daily basis. So why are there so many covered bridges in this particular area? 
Because our county is rural, and when the early settlers came here, they built many covered bridges because there's so many streams and creeks that wind and wander throughout the county. They had to find a way to get across, so they built the covered bridges, which as we know have lasted now for many, many years. And we have more here because when it came time that a bridge uh, might need something, our county had to find the funds to maintain it so that we could still use it. So we had to have a way to get across that creek. And so we did not tear down a covered bridge and any bridges that have been destroyed from floods or arson or something, some of those we've tried to rebuild. A prime example is the sanatorium bridge that's presently uh, has been moved to a new site off of private property. And that bridge is being restructured so that we'll be able to use it on a daily basis. We just don't have the funds in this area to be able to, you know, let a, a historical structure go by and, and not be able to get across the creek. The structure of the bridges, along with exceptional maintenance, is what has allowed the bridges to continue to be used over the years. Most of the bridges have similar construction, with the exception of only one. All of them have the burr arch support inside of them, except for one, and that's the... Um, Phillips Bridge, which is our shortest covered bridge. It's 43 feet in length, and it has the King Post Trust, but all the rest of them have the Burr Arch. They originally were made with tulip poplar, which that is a wood that's resistant to termites. The arches were made from oak so that they would have strong timbers to support and uh, help the equipment or help the cars or the vehicle get through. And although it's cars that go through now, it was at one time horses and buggies, which thankfully explains an inscription at the top of each bridge that left us a bit puzzled. You always notice we have our bridges named, and they were usually named for the community in that area or for the landowner in that area. And at the end of our bridges, you always see the inscription, cross this bridge at a walk. And that's because they felt that if you did not walk your horses across the bridge, the pounding of their hooves could cause structural damage to it. And also before, uh, at the time of Civil War, when the soldiers came through, they were always asked to break cadence because again, that heavy pounding they felt caused very severe structural damage. So you always walk across a covered bridge. But if you prefer to drive, Park County Incorporated offers a free map with color-coded routes to follow in order to get the full covered bridge experience. We have five color-coded routes that we have a map that we provide to anyone who asks, they're free. And they direct you to the different areas of the county, showing you the covered bridges along the way and of course other attractions. And you can do that year round. It doesn't matter whether it's during the festival, the spring, Christmas, we'll be getting ready soon for Park County Covered Bridge Christmas and everybody opens up their shops and decorates in the different areas and communities. So a lot goes on the entire year here in Park County. The festival Kathy mentioned is of course the Covered Bridge Festival. The 10 day event takes place each year in October and is well known not only locally for its original crafts and wares, but nationally as well. The festival got its start back in 1957 when the first three day event was held. Uh, in 1956, a lady by the name of Mrs. Cole wrote a letter to the local editor of our newspaper, William Hargrave, and she had brought some friends here to see the 42 covered bridges that we had at that time. Unfortunately, she could only find 20 of them. And she wrote a letter to try to convince the community they need to be doing something to show the people when they came here a way to find these beautiful structures out in these floor, uh, fall settings that you know they could find much easier than she did. So William Hargrave took the idea along with some other townspeople and they collected some funds and in 1957 they held the very first Covered Bridge Festival that was a three-day event. They had 2,500 people. They offered uh, food and products of people from here in Park County for that three-day event and they had over 2,500 visitors. Now we've become a 10-day event, always held on the second Friday in October, and we have over a million people to visit our county, countywide, during that 10 days. If you're one of those millions that have had the chance to experience Park County, you probably understand what makes the bridges so charming. But if you haven't, it's an experience many say is worth the trip. It's a piece of history that you can touch, you can use today. It's not something that was there, it's still here. And they're, they're a marvel of history is what they are. Uh, the covered bridges, um, 
hold a lot of serenity in them. Take some time and drive your car now, go to a covered bridge, stop, maybe get out, walk through it or go underneath it. Listen to the stream or the creek as it babbles down through there. And then just let your mind wander back a little bit farther and you can almost hear the horses and the hooves uh, going through the covered bridges. So they're, they're a real experience to, uh, to have and we love them here in Park County. There's all kinds of pre-range tours and self-guided routes that you can take when you venture over to Park County. The tourism office can always get you all set up. Unfortunately, we're out of time for this week, but if you'd like to learn more about the show, Cater I, or even that now famous car we drive in the open, just head over to our website at weiu.net and check out Heartland Highways under the television tab. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Heartland Highways, where every mile is an adventure. Now you can watch Heartland Highways online anytime. Check us out on youtube.com slash weiutv. Once you're there, just look for the Heartland Highways playlist, which will take you to a list of full episodes from season seven through 11. And now you can subscribe to our channel so you'll automatically be notified of when new programs are available to view. So sign up today. We're so glad that you shared it with you. No, you shared it with us. <laughs> it's your privilege it's to your watch privilege. us. You really are a diva today. <laughs> Not so much. Okay. Oh boy. We're so glad you got to watch us. Thanks. <laughs> you are truly lucky. So glad you had the honor of joining us. You're in an exclusive club. All right. Do you have a stroke? She just looked at me like, yeah, that's what I said. I looked at you like, what? 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 Like, None of that. Actually, I, I am. None of that.